Coming in at number five, we have Ozone Disco. What a name, I kinda wanna go. In March of 1996, a tragic accident happened in Q-Zone City's Ozone Disco. The local universities had just done their yearly graduation ceremonies. The students were looking to celebrate and there was a party being thrown for them at the disco. There were around 350 guests attending that night, even though the building had only been cleared to safely hold 35 people. Due to the large amount of people in such a small place, when the fire broke out, they did not stand much chance of escape. Tragically, around 200 people did not make it out that night. Not only did the fire consume the lives of many, but others were trampled in the chaos of trying to escape. The one fire exit the building had been blocked by the building next door, meaning the large amount of people who fled to it to escape became trapped. It was reported that when entering the building to look for survivors, the bodies were piled up waist high. Survivors of the fire explained how around midnight, sparks started flying from the DJ booths shortly after smoke appeared. Party goers thought it was part of the experience, that it was all pyrotechnics to mark the new day. This meant that many did not flee as soon as they should have. All of this combined into a huge tragedy that claimed the lives of so many who were just about to start their lives. Since the incident, the club has been closed and abandoned. However, those who are around the club at night have witnessed some paranormal activity. Some have heard music coming from the club's doors or seen disco lights from a distance. You might think these are just kids who have snuck into party, but others have heard disturbing screams for help, but as they got closer to investigate, the screams fade away. There is a clear warning to those who might try to visit the place today that it's not safe. You might meet a paranormal spirit angry from the tragedy, or you might have a dangerous accident of your own. Coming in at number four, we have Malacanan Palace. Malacanan Palace is the White House of the Philippines. It is the official residence and principal workplace for the President of the Philippines. It was originally built in 1750, so it has a long history, making it perfect for some paranormal happenings. The building has been home to many important people, but has also been a part of revolutions within the country, leading to many tragic passings on the property. In particular, there is one story that during one of the revolts by the people, they stormed and seized the home. They found one presidential worker who is now unknown and made their own justice. Although this is not a confirmed story, it is often told to explain one of the paranormal guests who has been pictured outside of the home. They have been named the head ghost. The photo captured shows the outside of the palace with a headless figure facing the camera. It is thought that this poor soul was separated with his head before passing and now walks the halls searching for it. He is not the only ghost that has been spotted on the premises though. There have been sightings of former presidents, such as Manuel Cuzon and Manuel Roxas. There is also a report where Governor Emi Marcos, daughter Ferdinand Marcos, actually saw Cuzon's ghost at one point during her father's presidency. I guess when you dedicate your life to serving as president, it is hard to let go of the place you call home. If you were to visit, maybe keep your camera handy. You never know who you might just see. Coming in at number three, we have Clark Air Base Hospital. Clark Air Base Hospital was used during World War II and the Vietnam War. It now lays abandoned on a redeveloped Air Force base. It is said that as soon as you enter the destroyed building, you instantly feel the paranormal energy that belongs there. The locals believe it to be cursed and dare not enter. Due to this, it is seen as the most haunted hospital in the country. The hospital has been ravaged by time, most parts overgrown with greenery, with others simply falling apart. The hospital today does still attract ghost hunters. Due to the amount of pain and suffering that occurred during its time, there are plenty of lost spirits trapped. A number of visitors have reported hearing voices echo through the empty halls of the hospital. Some hear screams. It is said that the voices of those trapped are of the soldiers who lost their lives in the war. It seems they feel they have unfinished business in the world. Many would have left behind their families to serve their country. These are not the only patients still staying there though. The first floor ward was home to the hospital's pediatric center. People have heard the screams of newborn babies and children laughing. One security guard even heard the running footsteps of what sounded like a child. This entity ran straight past him one night while on patrol. He has since refused to patrol within the hospital walls. The hotel did still operate after the war until a nearby volcano erupted covering the hospital in ash. This was taken as a sign by the locals that nature was warning them to stay away. There are also those who ignore the warnings and venture inside. Just be warned, it seems to have a habit of causing tragedy. Coming in at number two, we have Laparole House. The Laparole House was built by Roberto Laparole in the 1930s. During World War II, the house was used by Japanese soldiers. They were reportedly a nasty group of brutes. They attacked local women, tortured suspected ties, 
and even ended their life once they received any information that they had. The house is said to have seen many horrors due to all of this, and the home was never the same after the soldiers left. Those who had been there within this time warned others to stay away. The house transferred ownership after the death of the head of the Lapparal clan. They attempted to maintain the home, but the years and horrors do show on the home's old exterior. The house has withstood much more than those around it, both man-made and natural disasters. To everyone's surprise, the house was still standing after the deadly earthquake of 1990. In 2013, the home was turned into a museum. It was at this point that we started to hear more details about the hauntings inside. The show has been visited on many ghost haunting shows along with being featured in a film. Those who have visited the house have told of what they found and why the house is visited to often by paranormal investigators. One visitor claimed that they heard screams coming from the lower sections of the home. They rushed to go see if someone was hurt, but they found nothing. As they read more about the home, they believe this could have been linked to where the torture happened during the war. Others felt a dark presence in various sections of the home. Cold spots or a feeling of sadness that disappeared as quickly as they had felt it. Some said they felt watched, like there is an entity in the home that no one can see, but it is watching all who visit closely. One man claimed he heard water running in the rooms, but when he went to turn it off, there was nothing there. Not even a source for any water to be coming from. The home is haunted by the ghosts of the past, but might also hold an ancient entity that causes you to feel watched. Either way, this is not a home I'll be visiting anytime soon. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Manghit Cave. Manghit Cave got its name from the smell of the accumulated bat droppings inside the cave. Located in the central Philippines, this is a scary location due to more than the hauntings. Many people are scared of entering dark and possibly unstable caves, but this one contains more than just the fear of confined spaces. The cave is popular by those who like to explore deep into caves in their spare time. To do it at your own risk, the cave is said to be haunted by lost caving groups. The cave does not offer much light, and the deep you go, the more lost you get. There have been a number of groups that have gone lost throughout the years with no remains ever recovered. There are so many hidden corners within its maze you will never be found. Those who explore it today have encountered a number of paranormal occurrences. Some reports seeing shadows not cast by them or their group like there is someone else with them. Others have heard footsteps scrambling around as if in panic. Finally, the further in you travel, the more you hear a distant scream of help. Often only one of two members of your team will hear this, no matter how far towards the voice you go, it will keep seeming out of reach. This causes people to go further and further into the caving system until their team bring them to their senses to head back. Those who have experienced this believe it may be how the others have gone missing. Some say there may be a demon living deep within the cave looking to bring the lost souls to feast on. Number 5. Leap Castle There are a ton of old haunted castles in Europe, isn't there? Like that was someone's house at some point. You gotta think, those chamber pots have been used for like a thousand years. Ugh, yuck. And of course, some dark and nasty history has gone down there at these places as well. You can feel it almost most of the time. Leap Castle, Ireland, built around 1250. Our first stone cold stop. This place has seen its fair share of bloodshed. Not just one ghost story, and not just a foe, but a friend. Well, family, actually. One of the most lived in castles in Ireland. It's seen some sh it's housed many a family, generation after generation, apparently built by the O'Bannon family way back. Legend has it, two brothers dared each other to jump off a cliff for house rights. Yeah, more of a myth, I think. Then comes the O'Carroll family. Now we get into some actual literature. Father dies, powerful family, no successor to take the castle. However, this turned into yet another brother versus brother kind of duel. Couple stabbings around the castle's chapel and enter stage left, lots of ghosts. Ruthless, right? The smell of burning and decay now apparently. The spirit of the murdered priest now lurks the stairwell isn't often reported by staff as a slain brother. What's with the brothers thing? Among the ghostly figures is also Emily and Charlotte, the ghosts of two girls playing in the main hall circa 1600s era. The most famous afterlife resident, the Red Lady. There have been sightings of this creature for centuries. She roams in a long red dress tall and lean. The red lady carries a huge dagger as well, with her hand raised. Can you imagine? Stone cold castle, middle of the night, just scrolling through Instagram after a nice Airbnb night, and you look up to a red ghost lady holding a knife at you. 
Yeah, I would just like cartoon run on air, you know? Number four, Karamakos. As always, if you like what we do here on Top 5 Scary, throw us a thumbs up down below or leave us a comment to ponder over. Halloween's just next week. Which haunted house does it for you? Churches do it for me, you know? Churches. I don't do creepy, creaky churches, you know? So many floorboards. Okay, so this planet is like old, old. We're finding things and sites that are literally changing history textbooks as we speak. Gobekli Tepe, Petra, like Syria and Turkey, these places are old, but Greece? Greece is like ancient old. Newsweek reported that in 2020, a collection of more than 30 inscribed tablets were found at the bottom of a 3,000 year old Athenian well in the ancient cemetery of Keramikos. Yeah, scary enough, right? You see these tablets bear individual curses and prayers to the Greek gods of the underworld. So all sorts of nasty energy just floating atop there. Juta Strawzek, who led the excavation, said that whoever ordered the curses inscribed on the tablets was unnamed. But the black magic seen, heard, and felt at the site is present there for all to research. Even though back then black magic and the use of curses was forbidden in Greece during that time, which makes this even more horrifying. Just refound in 2016, the cemetery itself was first excavated in 1870 from the Greek ministry. Progress halted during World War II, and the excavation then lost momentum. The excavation site consists of a massive sanctuary holding thousands of precious artifacts. Keramikos comes from the Greek word for pottery or ceramics, arguably the most important cemetery of ancient Athens, riddled with the oldest tombs and curses that went along with them. There's always like adultery feuds too, isn't there? I curse thee, Demetria, for looking at my Adonis. Like lots of jealousy and lying back then, it seems. Number three, Kaimuki House. This Halloween, if you're trick or treating, listen to old Uncle Kyle and do not go near this house. Located in the Kaimuki neighborhood of Honolulu, Hawaii, this place has a horrifying reputation. Apparently, murder and a most foul nature has occurred in the house many times. Murder case after disappearance, the local stories became fiction. It's now known by locals as the most haunted place on the island. And here's why. The house itself looks like a normal surf friendly home. Mmm, yeah, not really. Enter stage right, the Kasha. The Kasha is a creature said to reside in the actual house. It's a man-eating ghost from Japanese folklore. Not just story, the events from the Kaimuki house have been documented well documented. Interpretations of the monster includes a ghoul who lives and feeds on the dead, a cat-like demon from the sky who steals away bodies. However, all three versions have one thing in common. It's hunger for corpses. Ooh. In 1942, police officers were called to the house by a woman who apparently kept repeating, she's trying to get my children. Upon entering the house, the officers could do nothing but apparently watch in horror as the members of the family were all levitating and ragdolled and hurled across the room by an unknown force. The police were baffled and decided to just load everybody up in the car and leave the premises. The original Kaimuki house was torn down during the summer of 2016 and has since yet been under investigation and new construction. Okay. So no vacation in Hawaii this summer. No did. Number two, Ancient Ram Inn. Of course we needed an ancient old haunted inn, didn't we? Isn't this the start of like every great horror movie? The lights flicker in an old haunted inn in the middle of nowhere. The bell dings, but no one answers. Should have been a writer. Well, luckily this is also a functioning pub and it's located in Watton Under Edge, a market town within the district of Gloucestershire, England. Look at this place. It's like bending and molding to the earth, like a fence that's grown around a tree. This thing is old. The inn has been owned and operated by many people. Going back as far as a thousand years, since like 1145. <laughs> Hope they clean their beer taps. This inn was said to have been owned by the St. Mary's Church when first built. And of course, with that, it's haunted. The Ancient Ram Inn has been investigated by years of paranormal researchers. Television shows like Ghost Adventures and Most Haunted. The inn was investigated by UK paranormal study group, The Ghost Club, which is apparently the oldest paranormal research organization in the world. It's haunted, haunted. But what makes something haunted? Is it the age or the sinister events that happened in and around the premises? This land sits on the intersection of two lines that people think contain high spiritual energy. Using a map, of course, these lines trace directly to England's most sacred site, Stonehenge. Legend has it that the energy from Stonehenge feeds the property's paranormal power. Not to mention, the backyard is home to a 5,000 year old pagan burial ground. 
witches being burned at the stake on the property. Hey, if you see a pagan ghoul pouring himself a Guinness in the middle of the night, just say cheers and keep walking. Number one, Bran Castle. It's October, so we're feeling extra spooky around here at Top 5 Scary. We're familiar with the classics, right? If we're not, go and binge some horror movie marathons, people. The castle of all castles, Dracula. Well, kinda. What Dracula was based off of. Where he lived, at least. Also, the National Monument of Romania itself. Mm, fun fact. It doesn't get much more Halloween-y than this place, come on. Bran Castle is linked to the historical figure who inspired author Bram Stoker's creation of this half-bat, half-man. No, not Batman. Vlad III, Dracula. Otherwise known as Vlad the Impaler. Don't panic. This was like a couple years back. Like, mid-1400s. We know this guy, and yes, you heard it right, the Impaler. I don't really need to get into much detail with this one. To impale. Google it. Some believe Brand Castle was one of the sites which Vlad reigned. Unfortunately, history says that he wasn't around here. In fact, it says that he was only imprisoned here for a little bit. Yeah, although there's no coffins inside. Hmm. So what makes this place so scary? Apparently during Stoker's research to the region of Transylvania, he came across accounts of the atrocities committed by Vlad and used the Dracula name after studying him. And of course, this castle built out of wood originally, somewhere around the 11th, 12th century, seems to be pretty fitting upon research of the old haunted castles territory. Unfortunately, this thousand year old home isn't really a home anymore, just home to relics now, and the occasional cold breeze and fuzzy camera picture. Brand Castle acts as a museum now and a popular Halloween destination. Apparently they found a gold casket that houses the heart of Romania's Queen Marie in the walls. Yeah, that's pretty haunted castle material, no? In fifth place, we have Pendle Hill. Also known as Penhall, Pendle Hill is located in the Lancashire countryside near the villages of Burnley, Colne, Pattyham, Clitheroe, and Nelson. Pendle Hill is famous for George Fox's visitation, the Quaker movement leader in 1652, and the barometer experiments of Richard Townley in 1661. I feel like I'm missing something else they were famous for. Let's see if I can get the uh, gray matter in here working. Oh, oh right, it's home to a very famous witch trial. Locals to the area know very well the story of the 10 women executed for witchcraft at Pendle Hill in the 17th century, who, uh, you know, still haunt the area. The story of the Pendle Witches is an excellent example of a well-documented allegation of witchcraft. So this tale begins way back in the year 1612, when there was said to be a family of local peasants who lived in a vast limestone tower. However, the family was no ordinary family. These peasants had enormous powers and were reported to be in league with the devil. According to reports, the family made clay effigies out of teeth and uh, human hair. In a coincidence that's going to surprise absolutely no one, local people died of various mysterious illnesses or great pains at the time. The milk in the area turned sour and uh, cattle died mysteriously as well. People were kind of afraid to go up that hill. A local magistrate, Roger Norwell, made the decision to arrest two people living in the tower. They were brought to Lancaster for trial and two days later, the rest of the witches were arrested and also taken to Lancaster for trial. Out of the 12 folks on trial, one passed during the proceedings Another one was found not guilty, and the other ten were, uh, yeah, very much found guilty. On August 20th of 1612, all ten accused witches went to the way of the rope necklace at Gallows Hill. The history of the witch trials has given the place an eerie atmosphere and uh, several terrifying reports. Pendle Hill was featured on the show Most Haunted, during which several supernatural events are said to have taken place, including members of the show's crew being injured. Most of the ghostly activity is said to be out of spite from the witches, who continue to call Pendle Hill their cursed home. One tale of haunting and particular took place during a Ouija board experiment. Is my disdain showing yet? The stupidity was happening in the foundations of Malkin Tower, when a tooth suddenly landed on the center of the table. Now this caused everyone present to be extremely concerned, and after having obviously checked to ensure that nobody in the group had lost a tooth, which was, you know, definitely human, it left the folks involved in a quandary as to how it got there. The tooth was eventually identified as belonging to an adult of around 40 years of age, and was in fact an old tooth. And if, you know, a league of ticked off witches wasn't enough ghosties for y'all, a Bronze Age burial site has been discovered at the hill summit. You know, just a little bonus. In fourth place, we have Stirling, Scotland. This beautiful market town has played a pivotal role in the history of Scotland, along with playing host to multiple grisly stories and, you know, unsettled spirits. The imposing hilltop, Stirling Castle, is home to several ghosts, and I'm struggling to decide who to talk about in detail. Hmm, probably one of the mysterious ladies. Oh. 
I know, the green lady. It is believed that she was a servant girl in the employ of Mary, Queen of Scots, and a very gifted one at that, who was blessed with the powers of foretelling, or second sight. So this maiden had a premonition that if her queen slept even one night within the ancient fortress, she would not live to see dawn. So she told her mistress of the fears, and thankfully, Mary listened and offered to allow the girl to watch over her as she slept and, you know, call for aid should any threat present itself. Through the long, dark night, our serving gal sat, bundled in a great soft chair guarding her beloved queen. Weary from a long journey, Mary fell into a deep slumber as soon as her head hit the pillow. And this girl too was kind of weary. She barred the door and lighting a taper, sat by the bedside. There she sat for what seemed like an eternity, near hypnotized by the flickering of the taper's end. But try as she might, she could not resist the weariness in her bones. Her limbs grew heavy, her eyelids heavier still, and decided, you know, that maybe closing her eyes for a minute wouldn't hurt since she was so exhausted. Hey, we've all been there. But what seems like no more than a few moments, she opened them again, blinking against the sudden brightness of the chamber. She, uh, you know, through bleary eyes, tried to call out, but found her throat so dry and realized that the tiny taper, set so carefully by the queen's cot, had fallen, lighting the bedclothes and tapestries on fire. Coughing, she darted from her chair, gathering the deeply sleeping queen in her arms, and carried her towards the door, barely managing to get her to safety before eventually passing from smoke inhalation. Sadly, her name has been forgotten. She is known only by the color of the gown she wore, the Green Lady. So visitors to Sterling should be mindful that their female phantoms have one thing in common. Yep, yeah, I said phantoms, plural. It is said that whosoever looks even once into their eyes won't make it through the night. So if you notice like a ruffled robe or a well-turned spectral heel as you're passing around, turn away, avert your gaze, because you don't want to risk your soul. Some say that Queen Mary herself haunts the castle, roaming the grounds in a pink dress. The Darnley Coffee House on Bow Street is also said to be haunted by a mischievous poltergeist, while the Old Town Jail is home to the spirit of the last man that went the way of the rope necklace on sight. In third place, we have Edinburgh, Scotland. So the beautiful city of Edinburgh is well known for its ghostly activity. For starters, the Southbridge vaults are haunted by several different ghosts. During the Irish potato famine of 1845-47, to 47, thousands of Irish folks immigrated to Scotland seeking, you know, survival. Forced into the vaults under the bridge, as many as 10 people lived in a single room. The conditions were poorer than the tenants. Crowded and damp with barely any air circulation. And just like that, the area quickly became Edinburgh's uh, red light district. Services of the night, please tell me you get what I'm referencing. Gambling and a thriving black market were commonplace in the vaults. By the late 19th century, the vaults were closed off for good, in an effort to drive the um, seedy activity out from under Edinburgh's main thoroughfare. For decades, these vaults sat empty as their icky past slipped into obscurity. Obscurity that ended in 1998 when a local man crawled through a narrow passageway in one of his buildings and rediscovered the rooms underneath the bridge. Since then, the cavernous vaults of Southbridge have been open to the public, and the reports of ghosts have poured in. Honestly, what have I said about leaving hidden spaces that are blocked off B? Nothing good comes from opening them. Witnesses have claimed to feel cold gusts of air, hear voices, and to see and sense an intangible presence. Some ghosts are quite bold, like the, um, spectral youngling Jack, who likes to grab visitors' hands in the wine vaults. You know, just for funsies. While another more menacing presence is known as Mr. Boots. He's an unkept man that was named for his, you know, tall footwear. He lurks in the back section of the vault and has been known to uh, push and throw rocks at visitors. Some have claimed to hear his footsteps on the cobbles and his echoing voice cursing throughout the chambers. It's even rumored that in the 1820s, the infamous serial killers William Burke and William Hare lurked within the vaults, killing some of their 17 victims there and storing the bodies in that same location until they were sold off for medical dissections. Visitors to Edinburgh Castle also frequently report sightings of apparitions. A young piper who disappeared without a trace hundreds of years ago can still be heard today, with the faint haunting sound of a lost soul. As well as the story of the Manish Piper, the dungeons are frequented by a headless drummer boy and a gaggle of French prisoners captured during the Seven Year War who are regularly sighted in and around the castle. If you hear the bark of a dog in Edinburgh's old town, yet there's nothing there, it could be Bobby, a phantom sky terrier that is known to all in the city. The faithful hound spent 14 years guarding his master's grave until he finally passed away in 1872 and was buried in Greyfriars Kirkland, near his owner. People still hear his little bark near his grave. A small statue of Greyfriars Bobby is a popular landmark on the corner of Candlemaker Row, and it's good luck to rub Bobby's nose. Aw, here I am tempted to plan a trip, mainly to give a good ghost doggy a pet. Oh, almost forgot. Greyfriars is a graveyard that dates back to the 16th century and is the resting place of several infamous characters, but the most gruesome story is that of uh, B-L-O-O-D-Y. 
Mackenzie. Look, the interwebs really don't like when I say that word, so bear with me here. This wealthy lord was tasked with punishing hundreds of prisoners who refused to change their religion. Locals believe that the ghost of Mackenzie haunts the graveyard after his tomb was disturbed by a homeless man who broke into the graveyard at night. As soon as he laid hands on the tomb, the floor opened up beneath him and he dropped into a shallow grave containing plague victims. Since then, many other freaky episodes have taken place nearby. A woman was found unconscious with bruises around her neck, and many claim that it was Mackenzie's poltergeist, continuing his evil deeds and death as he did in life. No biggie. In second place, we have Canterbury Kent. While this medieval city might be aesthetically stunning, it has quite the dark past. The ghosties here tend to be a little more spread out than other places, and have different tales, so let's have fun with some short and sweet descriptions. For starters, Canterbury Cathedral, a pilgrimage site for centuries, is the home to many restless spirits. Archbishop of Canterbury was famously and brutally killed by the King's Knights in 1170. Beckett's place of death has a large welded cross above it with two swords. His tomb can be found near the high altar, where his apparition still appears to visitors. Other cathedral ghosts include a nun and the ghost of Simon of Sudbury, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury from around 1375. Other paranormal hotspots in Canterbury include Tiny Tim's Tea Room, haunted by the spirits of three younglings whose remains were found within the walls during restoration. And hey, if you hang around Hawks Road, you might glimpse Abigail, a sad soul who frequents the area. Another spooky house in the area is the Bishop's Finger, which is located on St. Dunstan Street. In the 19th century, a housekeeper by the name of Ellen Bleen discovered that her employer, a priest, was having an uh, affair with a younger woman. It is said that Ellen poisoned the pair with a meat pie and then uh, vanished from the city. Shortly afterwards, it was discovered that she had been buried alive as her body was found nearby. Ellen is said to wander the streets and manifest herself in the Bishop's Finger every Friday. She's described as, you know, plain faced, larger lady in a long white skirt and a mob cap. There are more haunted places in Canterbury, but sadly, I don't have all the time I would like to go into more detail. In first place, we have the village of Pluckley. Included in the Guinness Book of Records as the most haunted place in Britain, the Kentish village of Pluckley's popularity amongst ghosts and ghouls had to make it the number one spot on our list today. Wandering monks, decapitated highwaymen, and all manner of central casting spirits reside here, but special attention should be paid to the particularly gruesome story of the Pluckley watercress lady. Seen smoking a clay pipe and living on the banks of the river about a century ago, the woman would sell watercress to the locals and drink gin from a flask, my kind of lady. Falling asleep one evening, it is believed that her pipe scattered ashes onto her rags and she uh, burnt to death. So nowadays, a pink glowing specter can allegedly be spotted at the exact location where she went up in flames. Now, before someone asks why this place is scarier than the others on today's list, you know, other ghosties who frequent in the town include uh, the specter of the highwaymen who hide in a tree at Pinnock, a phantom coach and horses who pop up in several areas around the village, the ghost of a Romani woman who drowned in a stream, a miller who has been seen at Mill Hill, the hanging body of a schoolmaster in Decky Buss's lane, a colonel who hanged himself in Park Wood, a man smothered by a wall of clay who drowned in the brickworks, the lady of Rose Court who is said to have poisoned herself in despair over a love triangle, the white lady, a young woman who was apparently buried inside seven coffins and an oak sarcophagus who haunts St. Nicholas's church, but not to be confused with the red lady, reputably a member of the family who haunts the churchyard of St. Nicholas's church. Oh, and a small white dog has also been reported in the same location. Now, I don't know about y'all watching, but that's a few more ghosties than I'd like to see in a smaller town. And the fact that they like to roam and not stay in one spot? Hard pass. Kicking off at number five, Ashai, A Song of Ice and Fire. And you may have noticed that even over three parts of this list series, this is our first stop into the world of Planetos and George R. R. Martin's phenomenal piece of fantasy literature, A Song of Ice and Fire. Hey, listen, stop hating guys. I've been waiting for this series to be completed since the late 90s. We can wait a little bit longer. Give the guy a break, all right? These things take time, but that's by the by, because whilst we're waiting for the winds of winter, we can pass beneath the shadow and cast our gaze to the east, to the Shadowlands, and its most mysterious and notorious of cities, a shy or a shy by the shadow if you're being particularly ominous. You see, the thing is though, the reason this entry takes number five in our list is because it's merely a matter of perspective when it comes to describing the fear by behind a shy. You see, George Martin is a stickler for history, and his allegorical appreciation of our own human history is exactly what makes his work so applicable here. From a Westerosi perspective, the land of a shy, a mysterious port city in the far southeast of Essos, where the Ash River meets the Jade Sea, cascading down toward the Saffron Straits, and then beyond that, a mountainous peninsula, the Shadowlands. That landscape, told by sailors and pirates in port cities, then becomes the most foreign and remote places 
unimaginable to a small boy from Flea Bottom. And with that lack of knowledge comes fear. There's a lesson there. Yes, a shy is a city made of black stone that drinks light. It is dark and gloomy. Its inhabitants are masters of ancient and arcane knowledge who worship the black goat and where anything goes as far as magic is concerned. But you see, all of these are whispers. We've never seen a shy, and we may never will. But the mystery is what keeps us curious. It could be the most terrifying hive of dark magic in the known world, or it could be that words are wind. And therein lies the point. Swinging in at number four, the Never Never, the Dresden Files. Contrary to that though, talking about places that certainly are incredibly well described landscapes of arcane and supernatural horror, we have to talk about Jim Butcher's The Never Never, the literal afterlife in his fantastic Dresden Files series. Now if you know anything about Butcher's work, you'll know that he has a particular knack at reinventing prominent horror tropes. In his world, vampires, werewolves and warlocks alike are fully fleshed out as intricate and individualistic entities, not any two of them are alike, and in many ways similar to Martin's work, only grey areas exist when it comes to the inner workings of the denizens of magic. And talking about reinvention, or I suppose homogeneity is a better term in this case, who better to take every afterlife in myth and legend and collide them all into one? The never never, the spirit world that exists alongside the mortal plane as a sort of alternate dimension, but is certainly not a mirror image. The never never is a vast and winding entity, it is far, far larger than the mortal world perhaps even infinite, and despite the vast knowledge of Harry Dresden and many other characters in the series, little is known about its inner working. You see, although I said it's not exactly a mirror image, it also kind of is, and wherever the Never Never touches the mortal plane, those two places will have a resonance of energies. If a portion of the Never Never is a mass of misery and evil, it will touch a place of the same energy in the mortal world, an abandoned prison perhaps, or the scene of a brutal massacre. In Butcher's series, the Never Never is heaven, hell, Olympus, Elysium, Tartarus, Gehenna, it is both the summer and winter courts of the Sheep. The true mystical terror behind this mysterious webway is again how little is known about the place. So far, if it involves the Never Never, Harry Dresden's response is to just leave town. It's probably for the best. Next up at number three, the Hotel Dolphin, 1408. And whilst many of you will probably wonder why the Overlook Hotel doesn't take this spot instead, my response would be, room 1408 is far more terrifying than that place ever could be. And also, in many ways, 1408 is perhaps one of Stephen King's most terrifying, well, monsters, I guess. Because if you've read his remarkable 1999 short story, 1408, then you'll know how truly terrifying this entity of a room really is. Now, obviously, this particular entry isn't going to go without spoilers, so I'll try and keep things as loose and as fast as I can in order to paint just how demonic this hotel room really is. But if you're really not in the business for having this story ruined for you, just pop on over to the next point. You see, as the tale describes, King's protagonist Mike Enslin is an author, a famous debunker of haunted houses and paranormal places across the United States. Ten nights in ten haunted houses, ten nights in ten haunted castles, and of course, his next release, ten nights in ten haunted hotel rooms. And as Mike Enslin finds out at the Hotel Dolphin on 61st Street in Dallas, Downtown New York City, there is a room of such bloody infamy that has been left empty for over 20 years. Upon his arrival, the hotel manager gravely warns him of room 1408's morbid history. He has been responsible for at least 42 deaths, 12 of them suicides, over a 68 year period. But he's heard it all before. Mike Enslin does this kind of thing for a living, and he won't be dissuaded by the pleas of some hotel manager. Well, obviously, I won't paint too much of a vivid picture because really, you should read 1408 if you haven't already, but some of the scenes depicted in this story are genuinely some of King's most terrifying pieces of prose, particularly when it comes to a certain phone call that incessantly won't stop ringing. Yeah, it's probably for the best that I just leave things there, but room 1408 at the Hotel Dolphin is certainly one of the most memorable and equally terrifying places in horror literature. Coming in at Number two, Autumno, the Silmarillion. And truth be told, although 1408 is a terrifying place, what better way to shatter the confidence of our imaginations than an entire iron fortress of some of the most evil entities ever created in fantasy fiction? You see, I've seen a lot of you top five scary fans calling for Mordor to appear on this list, but hey, we all know that Mordor is merely the summer home of the Dark Lord himself, and the real stronghold of evil incarnate is Atumno, or Adun, if you're so inclined. For fans of J.R.R. Tolkien's legendary work of fantasy, The Lord of the Rings, you'll know that the companion behind 
behind the series, the Silmarillion fleshed out the primal evils of the world. The prime of those evils was Melkor and this place, Atumno far in the north of Middle Earth during the first age was the location of his deepest of fortresses. It lay in the Iron Mountains above even Angband, his vanguard stronghold carved into the very flesh of the earth. And essentially if you're wondering where all of the many demons, wraiths, trolls, balrogs and even the hideous race of orcs were first birthed from, it was this place. During the time of the lamps, the creation mythos of Middle Earth, Melkor the first Dark Lord began digging his great pits deep within the bowels of the earth, clawing his way into the darkness where he then lured and called out to the evil powers of the world to join him. Here he existed for millennia, eventually expanding upward through the Iron Mountains to the surface where he constructed his vanguard fortress of Angband to wage a war upon the Valar in the War of the Lamps. Listen, there is so, so much lore behind the Silmarillion, particularly when it comes to Arda, but do you know that scene in the Fellowship of the ring where my man Gandalf does the whole fly your fools thing and has to wrestle with the Balrog. Well, yeah. This place is where they hibernated. And when I say they, I mean an entire army of them. Atumno. It's not a nice place. And finally, coming in at the one spot, the jaunt. And you see, I thought long and hard about where to place this entry on our list. And I'm relatively certain that when you strip it all back, the jaunt is perhaps one of the most terrifying places ever penned in literature. And who best to pen it? Of course, Stephen King. Hey, listen, I'm not bothered if we have the King of Horror show up twice on our list. In fact, I'm honoured. But for those of you that have read his 1981 short story, you may understand exactly why we have to put this place at the top of the pile. First published in the Twilight Zone magazine and later added to his 1985 collection, Skeleton Crew, this is perhaps one of King's most explicitly science fiction entries. The Jaunt, which is a short enough read, is a tale that takes place in the early 24th century, where the technology of teleportation, referred to as jaunting, is entirely commonplace and is used for instantaneous transportation across enormous distances where humanity has now pretty much colonised our entire solar system. Now I'll try my utmost not to ruin any of the actual bones of the story which solely features a young family about to jaunt their way to Mars, but it's in the exposition of this place that truly takes you off guard. You see, the jaunt is the place that you must pass through in order to be a recipient of this instantaneous teleportation and thus travel such immense distances. But as the pioneers in the early days of this technology quickly discovered, a traveller has to be completely unconscious to survive the jaunt effect, as is explained by the family's father as they prepare to undergo general anaesthesia at the beginning of the story. Alright, I'll stop there because really if you haven't read it I'm sure that there's a PDF floating around somewhere for you to sink your teeth into, but honestly, I'm not sure if it's just me, but King seemed to have struck on an oddly specific nerve here. Maybe the jaunt is Todash darkness, maybe it's the place that we see when we close our eyes and go to sleep at night, but one thing is for certain. I don't ever want to find out. Number five on this list is Panola Hall. Panola Hall is a beautiful Georgian home that is deeply haunted and also something that you can buy if your heart so desired. Rocket Home says, Panola Hall was originally built for Henry Tripp in 1854, but its most popular resident is simply known as Sylvia. Said to be a young, beautiful, shy spirit, Sylvia typically appears on the stairwell with a rose in her hair and wearing a white hoop skirt dress. Her presence also brings about a strong smell of roses. The beautiful antebellum home is decorated with heart pine floors, 12 foot ceilings, a second floor balcony and a secret tunnel. At the time of writing, this home has a pending offer. Now I looked into this home guys and apparently you can buy it for around $700,000. Which in all honesty when looking at the property and everything that it has to offer is a pretty good deal. Now maybe they are factoring in the whole haunted by a spirit thing into the price and that's dragging it down a little bit. Granted, this doesn't seem like the worst ghostly presence ever. Like she smells like rose petals so that's something that's pretty nice and she's shy and pretty and probably pretty nice by the sounds of it. I do think that I would get triggered every time I smelled roses though. Like think about if you were on the toilet and then you just got the sudden smell of roses. Now you know that Sylvia the ghost is watching you do your business and I'm not sure if I would buy with that so much. I don't no, this one is definitely a mixed bag for me. Sylvia seems nice, but I still think that I like my home ghost free if it's up to me. Number four on this list is the Pillars Estate. The Pillars Estate is a real blast from the past. Like this home hasn't heard that we're in the year 2022 yet. Rocket Home says, sometimes a homeowner loves their home so much they can find it difficult to leave even in the afterlife. Such is the case, many believe, for the Pillars Estate, an 1878 mansion in Albion, New York. 
The homeowner we're referring to is Murty Carr who moved into the home with her husband William in the 1940s. It's said that Carr loved the home so much that she purposely told one of her daughters that when she died she would never leave it. According to the current homeowner, Tony McMurdy, she's kept that promise. McMurdy, who has spent more than 10 years carefully restoring the home to its original splendor, has had his fair share of haunting experiences including hearing doorknobs jiggling and seeing the apparition of a woman lying in bed. Despite the paranormal activity, it's believed that Carr's presence is warm and friendly and that she's happy to see the care McMurdy has put into her beloved home. The Pillars Estate in Albion, New York is one of the oldest homes in the area. When you turn that antique key and step inside, you go back in history. The restored home is filled with antique furnishings, many of which are included in the sale of the home. McMurdy also added an extravagant ballroom featuring a grand staircase, dark wood features, chandeliers, and a bar. So not only has the home not recognized it's 2022, neither has Carr apparently. I personally have absolutely no interest in lying in bed and then being woken up by the feeling of a ghost lying right next to me. My bed is a sacred ghost free zone and not even a cool 1850s house will make me give up on that. Number three on this list is the Wickoff Villa. The haunting for the Wickoff Villa is kind of up in the air right now as to if it's even haunted in the first place. I'll tell you guys the history of this and then let you guys be the judge. Rocket Home says the Cape Vincent New York home was built as a summer estate for William Wickoff of Remington typewriter fame. Unfortunately, Wickoff died of a heart attack the first night he spent in the home. The villa then went to his son, who sold it to General Electric after the family lost its fortune during the Great Depression. Depression. However, the company abandoned the home during World War II and it has sat vacant ever since more than 70 years. A ghost of its former self, the once ornate home has been stripped of its doors, windows, stained glass, and marble features. But even as a shell of a mansion, the Wickoff Villa is stunning. Its new owner, whoever that may be, will need to commit to a true labor of love as this home will require a complete rebuild. The property shows promise, though as it includes close to seven acres of land and three waterfronts. So this home has definitely seen its fair share of stuff over the years. We got depression, war, a bunch of stuff that could easily have left a spirit behind. Not to mention the place was abandoned for decades and who knows what sinister things happened during that period of time. Because it was abandoned for so long, there aren't too many paranormal stories, but locals still think something is off about this place. If you want to find out for yourself, well, you're free to buy the place. Number two on this list is the Yuli home. So many of these places are haunted by their original owners and this one is no different. Rocket Home says, built in 1890, the Yuli home still has many of its original features, including its Yuli bricks, the brickwork original owner Stefan Yuli was known for around Silver City, New Mexico, where the home is located. Stefan and his wife Susanna were pioneers and two of the first settlers in the area, which served as a tent city during the mining boom. It's believed that Stefan and Susanna still haunt the property today. The Victorian home requires some renovation work, but has a number of great features features including a balcony, basement, and one bedroom apartment attached by a breezeway. So if you buy this house, you get to experience the ghosts of two pioneers just absolutely swell. It's said that these two spirits will often cause tons of problems at the home in an attempt to get rid of you from it. So even though you may buy this home and it's good to go, within a few months you'll have renovated it tons of times over because these spirits keep messing it up. Just on a pure investment stance alone, it doesn't seem like the best idea to buy this one. And finally, number Number one on this list is the Lake Forest Schwepp Mansion. A Lake Forest Mansion. This place is just made to be the setting for a horror movie. Rocket Home says, built in 1917 in Lake Forest, Illinois, the mansion was a wedding gift from John Shedd to his daughter Laura and his new son-in-law Charles Schwepp. The stunning property had 27 rooms, ornate chandeliers, and carved wooden paneling. It was so exquisite that the Schwepps entertained royalty on more than one occasion while living in the home. Unfortunately, Laura passed away in 1937 and four years later, Charles committed suicide in the home and left an ominous note that read, I've been awake all night, it's terrible. After his death, the home sat vacant for 46 years until Donna Denton and her then husband purchased it. They were the only people to own the Lake Forest Schwepp Mansion and once joked that the home was big enough to share with any spirits who lived there. Good thing because the mansion was said to be haunted by Charles, Laura, and several servants who lived in the home. Jeez, well now I'm gonna be up all night as well, Charles, because your spirit isn't going to let me fall asleep. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this show before, but there's a comedy show out there right now called Ghosts. I haven't watched it personally, but just based on the commercials, these are the vibes that
that I get. Now from my understanding, the ghosts in the show are supposed to be fun and silly, and these ones in real life aren't that way inclined. But maybe whoever owns this house should just play that sitcom on repeat and hope that the real life ghosts get the idea. I don't know, it's worth a shot. Good evening, haunted minds of the interwebs. I'm Alexa, the resident nookie spooky girly, and today I'm so happy to talk about an interest of mine, graveyards. I know, everyone's shocked. Me? Graveyards? Never. I swear it's a coincidence, but I happen to live within a walking distance of a particularly nice one, and it's a great area for evening walks. You know, safely. But on that note, here are the top five haunted cemeteries you've been warned not to visit. Number five, Union Graveyard. This specific cemetery is located near Stepney Road in Easton, Connecticut, and dates back to the 1700s. According to Ghost Hunters, it is one of the most haunted cemeteries in the entire United States. The most popular ghostie is the elusive white lady, popularized partially thanks to Ed Warren having an obsession with her and possibly catching footage of her. Some believe she is Harriet Seeley, whose young son passed shortly after being born, and Harriet herself passing soon after. After. Legend believes she may have died in hopes of finding her son and still wanders their final resting place searching him out. Others believe she is the ghost of a woman from the 1940s who killed her husband and later herself and is doomed to wander the graveyard. Her physical description is the one thing that remains consistent. She is a young woman wearing a white dress with dark hair. It seems as if she enjoys scaring the daylights out of the living, so my kind of gal. Many who have witnessed her believe they have almost hit her with their vehicle, only to find no trace of her once they pull over. Others claim they have often seen her hovering slightly above the ground around the cemetery, going back and forth amongst different gravestones. In 1993, local firefighter Glenn Powell received a call about a transformer explosion and drove to the scene of the incident with a police officer and observed a female driver following closely behind him on the road. He remembers the night sky had turned pink, and the explosion emitted large amounts of electricity that made the hair on his arms stand up at uh, quite the distance. Glenn was driving along the road beside the cemetery when the officer seated next to him yelled, Watch out! In the middle of the road was a woman with long brown flowing hair and wearing a white Victorian nightgown. Glenn described seeing a surprised look on her face before slamming on the brake, but was unable to avoid hitting her, describing it like hitting a brick wall with the back of his truck flying into the air and the policeman next to him being launched into the dashboard. The driver behind him jumped out of the car and helped the two men search the area of the crash to check on the woman, but she was gone. Glenn is quoted as saying there was no sign of bodily fluids, there was no clothing, there was nobody, there was nothing. Now Lorraine Warren used to often take walks through the cemetery, saying that it was one of the most haunted places around. Ed caught the white lady on camera on September 1st of 1990 at 2.40 a.m., which was his seventh night in a row of filming at the cemetery. Determined to have proof, and described dark figures surrounding her, shapes that he thought were wood ghosts that seemed to jump on her while well, they all argued. Now, the Warrens have also referenced a red eyes ghost, so a pair of red eyes which they claimed can be seen in the forest behind the cemetery, not to be confused with bike reflectors that locals have placed within the grounds to scare teens. The famous duo claimed the eyes belonged to Earl Kellogg, a man who was set on fire across the street in 1935. Number four, Highgate Cemetery. Highgate Cemetery is located in North London, England, and was assigned by architect Stephen Geary. There are approximately 170,000 people buried in around 53,000 graves across the West and East cemeteries for context, and Today's tale has to do with vampires. In 1967, two teenage girls were walking home along the nearby Swains Lane and claimed to have witnessed the dead rising from their graves by the cemetery's north gate. Another teenager had been awoken one night with something cold and clinging on her hand, which left prominent marks the next morning, while reports circulated of a tall man in a hat walking in the area before melting through the cemetery's walls. On Halloween night of 1968, a group of teenagers interested in the occult visited Tottenham Park Cemetery, at a time when it was being regularly vandalized by intruders. According to a report in the London Evening News on November 2nd, the teens arranged flowers taken from graves in circular patterns with arrows of blooms pointing to a new grave, which was uncovered. And by that I mean a coffin was opened and the body inside was uh, disturbed. But their most macabre act was driving an iron stake in the form of a cross through the lid and into the chest of the corpse. In a letter to the Hampstead in Highgate Express on February 6th of 1970, David Ferrant wrote that when passing Highgate Cemetery on Christmas Eve of 1969, he had glimpsed a grey figure, which he considered to be supernatural, and asked if others had seen anything similar. Sean Manchester claimed David's grey figure was a vampire, and the media quickly latched on, embellishing the tale with stories of the vampire being a king of the vampires, or practicing black magic. See, king of the vampires? That's my kind of guy. 
A rivalry grew between David and Sean, with each claiming that he could and would expel or destroy the Spectre. Sean declared that he would hold an exorcism on Friday the 13th of March, which, you know, it's a good spooky date for that uh, sort of thing. ITV conducted interviews with both men, and others who claimed to have seen supernatural figures in the cemetery, which were transmitted early on the evening of the 13th, and within two hours, a mob of hunters from all over London and beyond had swarmed over the gates and walls into the Lock Cemetery, despite police efforts to get them the heck out of there. Some months later, on August 1st of 1970, the charred and headless remains of a woman's body were found not far from the catacomb, believed to have been used in a black magic ritual. David was found by police in the churchyard beside the cemetery one night in August, carrying a crucifix and a wooden stake. He was arrested, but when the case came to court, it was dismissed. There was more publicity about David and Sean when rumors spread that they would meet in a magician's duel on Parliament Hill on Friday the 13th of April in 1973, which never occurred. The vampire is said to lurk until this day, so maybe I'll have to make a trip eventually to um, pay my respects if you get what I mean. Number 3. Hollywood Forever The Hollywood Forever Cemetery is one of the oldest in the state of California and is located on Santa Monica Boulevard. Many famous individuals are buried in the cemetery, such as Rudolph Valentino, Mickey Rooney, Anton Yelchin, and Judy Garland. First used in 1899, it features well over 50 acres of land for families and visitors. There are still thousands of spaces available and new mausoleums being completed, but it's time to talk about the ghosties. It should also be noted that Paramount Studios is located near the cemetery and it is said to be one of the most haunted movie studios of of all time. So let me know if y'all want me to uh, ever elaborate on that. We'll start with the obvious, and I think the most dedicated fan ever, the woman in black. Also, yes, my bias for unknown ghostly ladies, you know, known only by their outfits, is coming into play. This is why I choose to always dress up, because I'd personally hate for my last outfit to be my raggedy PJs. What do you think? Would uh, this be a good final resting outfit? If not, I'm open to suggestions. Rudolph had passed away at the age of 31 in 1926 after surgery from an ulcer, and over 100,000 people gathered outside the funeral home. Fun fact, there were rumors that a wax replica was used to protect the body at the service. He was quite the popular heartthrob at the time. Heck, I'm racking my brain for like a modern day equivalent, and I'm failing. Just imagine your celebrity crush, but everyone also liked that same crush to a crazy level. It wasn't until after he had been laid to rest that the woman in black began to appear, and mainly she likes to come out on the anniversary of his death, dressed from head to toe in black, including a veil. She would leave roses on the grave and was originally thought to be Pola Negri, the woman he was engaged to during the time of his death, but nope. Many women have come forward claiming they are the woman in black. However, none of these claims have turned out to be true. Alrighty, ghosty number two, Miss Virginia Rappi. On Labor Day in 1921, Virginia had attended a party for a Mr. Roscoe R. Buckle at the St. Francis Hotel, which was held to celebrate acquiring a very large contract. Sadly, at that very party, Virginia had become sick and mysteriously passed a few days later at only 26 years old. Now, many claims were made surrounding her death, including the possibility of R. Buckle taking sexual advantage of her, a claim that was later proven false but sadly had negatively affected his career. No one knows exactly what happened to her on that fateful Labor Day. Around the site of Virginia's grave, folks have reported the temperature dropping to an icy cold climate and have also heard what appears to be sobbing. Many believe that she is still dealing with this traumatic event, with many visitors clearly seeing her weeping on the edge of water that is located on the grounds. I'm sure there are plenty of other ghosties, so let me know if anyone knows of any that I might have forgotten. Number 2. Resurrection Cemetery Located in Chicago, this cemetery is the home of a very well-known ghostie, Resurrection Mary, who is also commonly referred to as B-L-O-O-D-Y Mary, blame the interwebs for the spelling out, has different origins, depending on who's telling the story, but the most shared narratives put her on untimely death sometime in the late 1920s to early 1930s, when she was either a victim of a fatal car crash on the way to a night of dancing, or the unfortunate victim of a hit and run accident while she was walking home in the rain. Most documented reports of Mary describe her as a young, fashionable blonde woman, no older than mid-twenties, wearing a white ball gown, accessories, and a hairstyle to match. The first person who claimed to encounter Resurrection Mary was a man named Jerry Pallas. In 1939, Jerry was at a popular dance hall when he was love struck by a young blonde woman. He approached her and and the two hit it off and spent the night dancing away, even sharing a scandalous kiss. According to Jerry, her hands were as cold as ice, but he had a warm heart that made up for it. So, you know, eventually, closing time came around and Jerry offered the woman a ride home, and she asked to be taken down Archer Avenue. She motioned for Jerry to stop in front of the Resurrection Cemetery, and when he did, she got out and vanished before his eyes. Jerry was shaken with disbelief, but not too frightened to seek out answers. The next morning, he made his way to the address where Mary said she lived, over in Southside. He knocked on the door and encountered her mother. Now, when Jerry asked about the woman he had met the previous night, she informed him that she'd been dead for nearly three years. It turned out that, yep, Jerry had encountered Resurrection Mary, and over the next few decades, several other men would have similar experiences. But that was the one that began the legend. One cab driver in the 1970s claimed to see a young woman standing in front of the Resurrection Cemetery one night, and he pulled over to check to see if she needed a ride, and as the woman approached the vehicle, 
Yep, she disappeared. Another encounter with Mary occurred in 1979 when a separate cab driver named Ralph claimed to pick up a young female hitchhiker he believed to be no older than 21. As the two drove up Archer Avenue, she suddenly jumped up and said, Here! Here! The car came to a sudden stop and the woman pointed to a small abandoned shack off of the left side of the road. Now, Ralph questioned whether this was actually where she wanted to go, but before he got an answer, she disappeared without ever opening the door of his cab. His encounter was detailed in a 1979 issue of Suburban Trip magazine. And in 1980, Claire Rudnicki and her husband Mark were driving down Archer Avenue towards the cemetery when they spotted a young woman in a white gown slowly walking down the side of the road. Now, it was immediately obvious that she wasn't an ordinary person as she was partially transparent with a white aura around her, almost as if she was glowing. Shocked, the couple wondered if they had just seen a ghost, and when they once again reached the spot where Mary was walking, you guessed it, she was gone. Mary is supposedly buried at this cemetery in Justice, Illinois, about a 30 minute drive southwest of Chicago, and it gives her her stomping grounds as well as her iconic name. She likes to stick to that particular stretch of road on Archer Avenue, between the cemetery and what was once the O. Henry Ballroom in Willow Springs. Over the years, several researchers have tried to determine the exact identity of Mary, but no one knows. Due to the number of sightings and the credibility of those who claim to see her, Resurrection Mary is said to be one of Chicago's most famous ghosts. Number one, Stull Cemetery. Stull Cemetery and the abandoned church that rests next to it is located in the tiny, nearly forgotten Kansas town of Stull. Oh, and it's believed to be one of the seven portals to hell. So counted among the most haunted cemeteries in the world, Stull Cemetery has gained a haunted reputation due to a legend that involves Satan. The legends say that these stories have been linked to Stull for more than 100 years, but none of them made it into print until the 1970s. Specifically, in November of 1974, an article appeared in the University of Kansas student newspaper that spoke of a number of strange occurrences in the Stull churchyard. According to the article, Stull was haunted by legends of diabolical, supernatural happenings, and the legends claimed that the cemetery was one of the two places on Earth where the devil appears in person two times each year. Apparently, most students learned of Stull's diabolical reputation from their grandparents or, you know, other older individuals, but that many of them claimed first-hand encounters with things that could not be explained. One student claimed to have been grabbed by the arm by something unseen, while others spoke of unexplained memory loss when visiting the place. The legends also say that the devil has been appearing here since the 1850s and insists that the original name of the town was Skull, and that the later corruption into that of Stull was simply to cover the fact that the area was steeped in black magic. Coming in at number five, Silver Bow in Bed and Breakfast. The Silver Bow Bed and Breakfast is located in Juneau, which is the capital city of Alaska. The inn is more famously known for its bakery that was founded in 1898 by the original owner Gus Messerschmidt. This is the oldest bakery in Alaska, and some say it is the best. Although people travel from far to taste the treats in the bakers, there are reports of paranormal activity in the inn above. The original owner and founder of the inn reportedly still haunts the premises. The story goes that the owner loved his bakery and inn. He spent his whole life dedicated to creating the finest bakery. From the day it was built, he spent all of his time here. He loved welcoming the customers and ensuring everyone enjoyed their stay. Inevitably, having spent all of his time at the inn, he was here when he passed away in 1938. He was so dedicated in life, it seems his soul was tethered to the place in death. Since he passed away, guests of the bakery and inn have reported a lot of paranormal activity. The most commonly reported sighting is of Gus opening his shop early in the morning. People have seen a figure matching his description walking around the halls as he once did to prepare for his day. This is not the only thing that guests have noticed. Some people have reported knocking on their bathroom door. When they go to investigate who it is, there is no one there, but they have a feeling of being watched. Many believe this is Gus checking up on the guests. He also wanted to ensure everyone staying there was happy. And people believe this is a sign that he's still checking in on the guests today. Coming in at number four, the Hotel Captain Cook. The Hotel Captain Cook, located in Anchorage, is notorious for its paranormal spirit, which has been nicknamed the White Lady. People often take ghost tours of the hotel, hopeful of a chance to meet this famous spirit. Although the origins of the ghost are mostly unknown, from her behavior, it appears she passed away in the woman's bathroom, or at least in the area which may have been home to something else before the hotel was built. The locals explain how she is bound to this place and is unable to pass on. She could possibly be cursed as she seems distressed about her situation. Since the hotel opened, there was a lot of paranormal behavior in the area. She would break the glass of the mirrors in the ladies' bathroom or swing open the doors to scare those inside. The hotel management had to step in when one guest used the bathroom stall located at the very end of the ladies' room. While in the stall, she felt something fall around her neck and start to get tighter and tighter. The woman panicked and ran from the stall. As soon as she left the cubicle, the sensation stopped since
since then the bathroom has been bolted shut as to stop this from happening to anyone else. She does seem to be mostly contained to this stall but there are still paranormal happenings. Lights turn on and off on their own, no one has been hurt since the spirit was locked away but I would still say far away from this hotel. Unless you're looking for an angry spirit, this is a hotel that should not be on your list of destinations to visit. Although, my parents were there and it's fine. Yeah. That gooch, that gooch gang. Coming in at number three, we have the Golden North Hotel. The Skagway Golden North Hotel may look like a classic hotel located on the main street, but it has seen tragedy and has the ghost to prove it. People say this place is haunted by a lady who passed away many years ago. She is bound to room 23 on the third floor, but her presence can be felt in the area around the building. The locals tell the story of how this woman became bound to room 23. It's unknown in what year the story takes place, but it was many years ago. The woman was visiting the hotel with her husband. They visited the area so her husband could go on a gold expedition. The expedition was over a number of days to possibly weeks and the wife was to stay at the hotel and explore the local area. The day arrived and the husband left on his expedition leaving his wife alone. Not long after the husband had left, the woman caught pneumonia. She became sicker and sicker. There was no one in the area able to help her. She had no way to get to a local doctor with no knowledge of the area. She sadly passed away in little over a week due to her illness. When her husband returned, he was heartbroken to find his wife had passed. She had been laying in their room for weeks awaiting his return. The locals were shocked to hear what happened and horrified no one had heard her cries and helped her survive her ailment. Since then she has been bound to the room. Other guests have heard sounds coming from the room which remains empty. The spirit can be heard coughing or choking. Some have said they saw her from the window of the hotel when walking around the area late at night. Some have even heard her cries for her husband. When anyone tries to investigate the room they just find it empty and cold. The cold of the room takes over you as soon soon as you open the door. You can feel you are in the presence of a spirit and are overcome with sadness. Coming in at number 2 we have Independence Mine. The Independence Mine, now known as the Independence Mine State Historic Park, is the site of a former gold mining operation. It is located in Palmer, Alaska. The mining history in the area dates back to at least 1897. The mining town now sits abandoned. The operations were temporarily halted in 1950 with the plan to eventually resume operations. They were never able to resume the operations. This resulted in a well preserved collection of mining equipment and buildings. Although weather has taken its toll, many of the buildings still stand today. As we know with many mines there are often accidents due to the dangerous nature of the work. Parts of the mine would often collapse. The mine is now a big tourist site as a look into the life and work of miners in 1897. The visitors have reported a lot of paranormal activity while touring the facility. Almost everyone who visits the mine sees some form of activity there. There are many apparitions that appear. They walk around the mine as if they were doing their usual day's work. Some have even seen cigar smoke coming from certain locations. You can smell and see the smoke but there are no cigars in the area that could be making the smoke. Tour guides have noted that they often have the feeling of being followed. They can feel themselves being watched each time they tour the facility. Some have even found footprints that don't belong to them or any one in their group. Although there is a lot of paranormal activity in the area, tourists still come to see the remains of the mining town. The ghosts seem to be well intended. They may merely be echoes through time of the souls who passed here. As far as we know, there have not been any visitors who have been hurt during their visit. I would still be wary of visiting here though. Finally, in at number one, we have At the White House. At the White House was built in 1902 and is now on the National Historic Register due to how long it has been standing in the community. It has had many issues since it was built. It was originally built as a hospital, then it was used as a daycare center, and today it is used as a hotel. Any building that was used as a historic hospital has seen a lot of tragic passings. When the building was used as a daycare center, there was a tragic fire. The building caught fire in the 1980s. It was fully restored following this. During the fire, the young woman who owned and ran the daycare was trapped inside. After ensuring all of the children were safe, she became trapped and unfortunately perished. Since the fire, her apparition has appeared around the home. Most guests believe her to be a kind spirit but she does bring on the feeling of dread and terror when she is in your presence. Guests at the hotel have claimed to be startled awake by the young woman standing at the foot of the bed. Once they wake up and become frightened, the spirit usually disappears. Workers at the hotel claim that she appears to show more interest in families, 
with children. She reportedly had a love for looking after children and even in death she wanted to ensure their safety during their stay at the hotel. It is unknown what room she was trapped in during the tragic fire but there are numerous cold spots around the hotel. Others have heard faint screams and cries coming from certain rooms. She is hailed as a hero for saving all of the children during the fire but guests are still frightened when greeted by her ghosts in the early hours of the morning. Number 5 on this list is Abbaye de Mortemer. This abbey is located in the French town of Mortemer in the Normandy region and has a deep history to it. In the mid 1500s this was a prosperous area filled with a bunch of monks. It was a growing town that was one of the most successful in the region. This didn't last too long though. When the 1700s struck, things changed quickly. The men who were funding this town grew greedy and cared little for the people that were living there. The abbey itself started to deteriorate and the monks began moving out. Soon it was a shell of its former self and only had four monks that it housed. This wasn't the end though because in 1789 this abbey saw the worst horror of its history. The French Revolution was at its height and sweeping its way through France. Religion was completely out of favour and that meant the four monks that were living there were also out of favor. When the revolutionaries got to this location and found these monks, they didn't hold back. They took them into the cellar of this abbey and brutally massacred all four of them with no provocation. People think that this was one of the main incidents that caused this place to become one with the spirits. Since then, many ghostly sightings have been reported at this spot. One of the most famous stories was in World War II. A British paratrooper landed in the forest nearby and was spotted by the Germans. He thought he was doomed for until a monk appeared out of nowhere and guided him to safety. It's believed that this is one of the spirits of the dead monks still trying to help those in desperate need. One of the most famous ghostly legends is the woman in white who wanders the grounds. This ethereal being floats through the area and was even photographed once before. Her origin is currently unknown but it seems that after the monks were killed this area became home to not only their spirits but many. Werewolves, goblin cats and other demonic things have also been spotted here. This place is deeply haunted and even though that one paratrooper was saved by a ghost, I think that's the exception rather than the rule and for that reason, I still wouldn't recommend going here. Number 4 on this list is the Chateau de Brissac. This chateau in France is located in the Loire River Valley south of the village of Angers in France. It's a very beautiful chateau and extremely unique because it's actually a mix of two different chateaus. In the early 11th century an initial castle was built on the land but then several hundred years later in the 15th century the land was taken over by the Duke of Brissac who had his own vision for the space. He tore down most of the castle except for the twin medieval towers and then built around those so you get this very interesting style of chateau. This chateau is also apparently the tallest in all of France. The great beauty of this castle and unique architecture aren't the only things that distinguish it though because it's also one of the most haunted. An expert on the castle named Wesley McDermott gives great insight into the entity haunting this building where he says, A double murder that occurred sometime in the 15th century within the walls of the castle has resulted in one of the more popular ghosts of the Chateau de Brissac, that of the La Dame there or Green Lady. The current residents, the Duke of Brissac and his family have become accustomed to her roaming the rooms but she has scared many a guest. She's often seen in the tower room of the chapelle wearing her green dress. What's most terrifying however is her face. If she looks at you, you'll see that her face has gaping holes where her eyes and her nose should be resembling a corpse. As well as her sighting, her moans are often heard throughout the castle in the early hours. After researching this, I found that Wesley was correct and there is no end to the stories and encounters people have had with this green lady. I honestly do recommend going to this castle to look at its beautiful exterior. Going inside though, is something that I wouldn't do. Number 3 on this list is Grey Le Bains. This is a commune that is in the southeastern part of France. The reason why this town is so haunted is because of all the conflicts that have taken place there over the years. If you name any significant war that has happened within France, it's most likely that at some point or another, a battle was fought at this place. This has caused a lot of untimely death of soldiers and also the civilians who were living there. All of this death has left some spirits behind and made it so that this town is deeply haunted. Even though this is a town, the area that is most haunted seems to be located close to the castle at the top 
of this town. The reason that I say at the top is because this is a mountaintop village and the way that this town is laid out has the castle right at the zenith. Therefore everything is cascading down from this haunted castle that towers over the rest of the residents. There isn't one ghost who lays a rule to this town but a collection of ghostly spirits. It's said that if you walk around the castle at night time then many voices will start to speak out of thin air. Shadows will dance on the walls as if someone is around you but once again there will be nothing. People also report having a a deep sense of uneasiness when they're in this area and feel unwanted. The ghosts here don't sound as dangerous as some of the other ones, but I still don't recommend checking this place out. Number two on this list is Chateau de Blende la Tour. This is a castle that is located directly in the village of Blende la Tour. This castle certainly isn't the most ornate in nature. It looks to prioritize functionality over beauty. This was largely because its main use was during the 100 years war and the French wanted to make sure it wouldn't get captured by the British. This castle is very unique with its haunting. It's always haunted by one specific ghost which I'm going to get into but on one particular day of the year this place goes off the rails with paranormal activity and it's this event that has given the castle the title as the most haunted castle in all of France. At midnight on All Saints Day, which is on November the 1st, it's said that a plethora of phantoms will fly out and circle around the tower of this castle. They will scream and wail and cause a major ruckus. People have also said that these wailings feel inherently sinister in nature, almost as if these ghosts are driving people away from this place. Reports have also said that chains can be heard smashing against the walls and screams from below in the tower are heard as if people are locked up there. This event only takes place on November 1st at midnight though and is now part of the lore and culture around this village. On a regular day, this castle isn't completely without ghostly apparitions though. The ghost of the master of the castle from the 11th century century walks throughout in a bloodied outfit. It's said that he was murdered with a dagger and that his spirit walks around to this day still holding that same dagger which killed him. Number one on this list is Chateau de Bonaguil. This castle is located in saint francois sur la masse and was built in the medieval ages. It's decently well kept considering how old it is today. As with most castles that were built around that time, this one played a critical role in the 100 years war. It's said that it was fought over multiple times and retaken by both sides multiple times as well. Aside from its deep history, reports of a potential haunting have run rampant all throughout France. In fact, people were so convinced that a spiritual presence was living here that a team went to go investigate it. This group of paranormal experts went in and made some startling discoveries. They said that when they got there, the thing that they noticed and detected the most was the sensation of somebody touching their shoulder, as if somebody was right behind you and had their hand just on one of your shoulders. This went hand in hand with a sensation of burning. Apparently the burning didn't have them in pure agony, but they were all reportedly uncomfortable for sure. The temperature changes didn't stop there either because it also got incredibly cold all of a sudden. Creepy noises, loud shouts, and a very guttural and deep moan that echoed throughout the castle were all things that this group had reported as well. Nobody knows who or what ghostly spirit is causing these occurrences, but it's clear that something isn't quite right about this French chateau. Number five on this list is the Hotel of Doom. Yep guys, there's literally a hotel in North Korea that's been nicknamed the Hotel of Doom. It sounds like something straight out of an Austin Powers movie, but I can promise you that Dr. Evil is not residing there. That's because the hotel itself, the largest building in all of North Korea, has never had a single guest in it ever. It's completely abandoned and never fulfilled its initial purpose of being the most prestigious hotel in North Korea. In fact, According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the 1,080 foot tall building is the tallest unoccupied building on the entire planet. 105 stories of just absolute nothingness. North Korea never finished the building because they just simply ran out of money. The whole country is estimated to have a gross domestic product of about $40 billion and the building is estimated to take roughly $2 billion to finish. So to finish this hotel, the country would need to allot 5% of all its money to get get it done. Needless to say, it won't be happening anytime soon. Even though this Hotel of Doom isn't housing any human visitors, that doesn't mean that someone isn't putting it to good use though. Well, maybe someone is a poor choice of words. It might be better to say something. Since the exterior construction of it finished in 2008, there have been rumors circulating about some sort of creature living in this hotel. Not a physical being like a werewolf or a beast of some kind, but a shadow figure that floats throughout. A little bit 
like a Dementor from Harry Potter, but even less humanoid than those were. The sightings have been few and far between because no one ever goes into the hotel. It's only ever been spotted from the ground looking up. People have reported a sense of uneasiness when walking past this building, but the building itself is also very intimidating. North Korea doesn't have many buildings of this stature, so this one definitely sticks out like a sore thumb. If a shadow creature has taken up residence here, then it's honestly done pretty well for itself. In fact, it may own one of the most expensive, albeit unfinished, properties in all of North Korea. Number four on this list is the prisons. And yes, you did hear that properly, guys. Prisons as in plural. Not just one, but all of them. North Korea is very secretive about everything that goes on there, so making a list about this country is pretty tough. Because of that, it's hard to identify one specific prison that's haunted, but based on the stories of these places, I'd honestly assume that all of them are. The amount of death that happens at North Korean prisons is actually messed up. In fact, a judge who survived Auschwitz said that these prisons are just as bad. The first section on Wikipedia in regards to these prisons writes, North Korean prison camps have conditions that are unsanitary, life-threatening, and are comparable to historical concentration camps. A significant number of prisoners have died each year since they are subject to torture and inhumane treatment. Public and secret executions of prisoners, even children, especially in cases of attempted escape, are commonplace. The mortality rate is exceptionally high because many prisoners die of starvation, illness, work accidents, or torture. There have also been reports that even if your father committed a crime, for instance, well, you'll also go to jail for it. Innocent people are being sent into these places with no due process and dying in these horrible and harsh environments all the time. Just how some of those German camps are haunted by those who were taken far too soon? I have to imagine that the same thing's going on here. Now we don't know for sure and there aren't any specific stories that have come to the light, but that's mostly because North Korea keeps all their info airtight and there have only been a few stories that have even come out about survivors of this place. I feel like it goes without saying, but obviously this is a spot that you should just never go. Number three on this list is Kim Jong-il's tomb. Kim Jong-il was the leader of North Korea for almost 20 years before passing in 2011. The Kim Susan Memorial Palace is a massive palace that used to house the initial ruler of North Korea, Kim Jong-il's father, Kim Il-sung. Once he died though, this massive place was converted into a mausoleum to respect the great leader and then later his son as well. This place is creepy as all holy hell though and is definitely haunted by these old leaders. Let's just take a quick look at what they currently have Kim Jong Il chilling in. It's this massive all glass container that he's been mummified in. His embalmed body just lies there all the time and it's actually a tourist attraction now. North Korea has opened this up to the public if you want to go and pay your respects to their great leader. If you do go, which I don't recommend doing because it's super creepy and kind of weird, but if you do, then ABC News writes, all visitors are required to pass through jets of air to cleanse them of dust. Tourists are required to bow at the feet and arms of the dead father and son. However, they are not permitted to bow at the head as it's considered disrespectful. Cameras and phones are not allowed. Apparently, the ghosts of these two former North Korean leaders haunt this place and people have seen their spirits wandering around the building. Kim Jong-il and his dad weren't the greatest of guys when they were alive, so I can only imagine that going to visit them in spirit form probably isn't going to be too much better. Number two on this list is the 38th parallel. The 38th parallel, according to Google, is a circle of latitude that is 38 degrees north of Earth's equatorial plane. It crosses Europe, the Mediterranean Sea, Asia, the Pacific Ocean, North America, and the Atlantic Ocean. The 38th parallel north formed the border between North and South Korea. Korea prior to the Korean War. This 38th parallel is actually a demilitarized zone between North and South Korea now. This area is really difficult to get across though for your average Joe. It's riddled with landmines and on either side of the borders there's a sizable military presence just waiting to strike if you do attempt to do anything. Regardless of how dangerous it is to cross though, many North Koreans have attempted to get through this zone and into South Korea to try and escape their current life that they have in their own country. Over the years since this zone has been there, many North Korean citizens have risked their lives trying to get across this place. There have even been stories of people getting in vehicles and just gunning it as fast as they can, hoping to get to the other side. If they do manage to make it the whole way, then South Korea is typically sympathetic to their cause and will invite them into their own country as a Korean citizen. Many of them don't make it though. They're usually gunned down and stopped before they can make it far at all from their own country. Because of this, it's believed this area is haunted by the ghosts of those who tried to make it across and couldn't. These people were so close to salvation but just couldn't quite make it the last little bit and now their souls forever remain here 
wishing they could have just pushed a little bit further. Not many people have seen them because this is a super hard area of the world to get to, but those who have have said that they look to be in sheer agony. That they cry out and reach for those that they seize in an attempt to get these people to save them. For more reason than one, I don't recommend going to the 38th parallel. Number one on this list is Sinchon. The North Korean town of Sinchon is located in the South Huangwei province of North Korea. This town was apparently the site of what is referred to as the Sinchon Massacre. Now the reason that I use the word apparently there is because this massacre is kind of all up in the air. The North Korean government claims that from the 17th of October to the 7th of December, the United States military killed just over 30,000 North Korean citizens. This next part was actually released by the North Korean Central News Agency in 1998, and fair warning, it's pretty graphic in its detail. They say the American soldiers drowned over 2,000 innocent people by dropping them from Soktan Bridge. They also drowned more than 1,000 women in Sowan Reservoir. Upwards of 1,200 patriotic-minded people detained in an ice warehouse were bitten to death by military dogs. The headmaster of Young Hae Won of Jungsun Primary School was sawed up alive. They even talk about how the American soldiers performed horrible atrocities on children, but I actually can't even say how they described it on YouTube or else this video would definitely get taken down. Now even though this is what the North Koreans have come out and said, the South Koreans heavily dispute this. They say that it was the Korean right-wing extremists and communists who performed these killings. Regardless of who was actually responsible though, or the true death toll figures, something horrible did take place in this town. The atrocity here left its mark, and it's believed that those who were killed haunt this place to this day. The innocent souls still wander around this town and can't find peace. Glowing orbs and ghostly apparitions are regularly spotted here. It isn't just one ghost or one type of ghost either, but a horrifying variety. Men, women, children, ghost-like figures have been spotted of all of them before. Definitely not a cute and quaint town that you would want to visit if you ever did find yourself here. Number 5 on this list is the Krakow Horror House. Located in the Wolodzostowska district of Krakow, this house has been reportedly haunted since 1990. The good news is you won't be able to miss it and therefore can avoid it pretty easily. It's said to have a tree growing straight out of the roof, weeds everywhere, has the windows and the doors all boarded up, has a lock on the gate and has barbed wire on the fence. So even if you did want to go in, it would be pretty freaking hard. This house is said to have been haunted ever since the owner in 1990 hung himself inside. After this happened, weird things began occurring at this home. After the man died, a couple moved into this house, but moved out only a month after living there. One of the crazier things that happened to them was that their car turned on all by itself and drove straight into their garage. A jewelry company tried their luck at this home next and met a similar fate of weirdness. Their jewelry kept getting inexplicably broken inside the locked drawers. Nothing was stolen, just broken or crushed. Finally, an IT company came into the home, but they were met with an onslaught of fires that started from their own computers. Nowadays, this place is totally locked up and can't even be accessed. It's known by all the locals as being one of the most haunted homes in all of Poland. Clearly, the man who took his own life wasn't too fond of others inhabiting his space and did whatever he could to get them to leave. It could be a bunch of weird coincidences, but the things that happen are just simply too weird to be chalked up as that in my opinion. Like how on earth does your car start by itself and drive straight into your home? It truly does sound like some ghostly intervention to me. If you don't want something weird and dangerous happening to you, then I would highly recommend avoiding this haunted home. Number 4 on this list is the Wieliska Salt Mine. This salt mine is truly unbelievable and looks like something straight out of a fairy tale. Nearby the Polish city of Krakow, this salt mine is so beautiful it's considered to be a world heritage site. This mine was established in the 13th century and was actually used for mining salt all the way until 2007. The mine descends to a depth of 327 meters and has horizontal passageways that extend a whopping 287 kilometers. This mine has some beautifully designed underground rooms and is a massive tourism spot for for people visiting Poland. Many of these tourists aren't aware that there's a legend surrounding these ancient walls though. It all started with a young boy many years ago. This young boy wanted to go and work in the salt mines because his family was very poor and he wanted to help support them. The foreman of the mine at the time would not accept his help because he thought that the boy was too young. After some pleading from the boy, the foreman finally told him that he could work for one week and if he was impressed with his workload, then he could continue on in the mine. 
The boy happily accepted the challenge, but when he got down there, started struggling heavily. That was right up until another man approached this child and told him that he would help the boy in exchange for a portion of his wages. The boy accepted, and with this man's help, was able to meet the foreman's expectations. The foreman paid the boy his week's wages, and as agreed, the boy then took his wages and offered a portion to the man who helped him. This man laughed him off though and revealed himself to be the treasurer of the mine, refused to accept the wages, and left the boy to his own devices. Ever since then, this treasurer of the mine has been spotted by workers or visitors throughout the years. He said to reward good behavior but punish those who are bad. Stealing salt from the mine or anything else will be punished, but hard work and honesty, as exhibited by the boy, is rewarded. In my opinion, this spot is probably safe to visit as long as you behave appropriately when you're down there. Number three on this list is Woodcoist Forest. Woodcoist Forest is a big forest that's located near the city of Krakow. This forest was just a normal forest until something extremely horrible happened back in 2001. It's said that nine students were out at the forest having a bonfire, drinking, and celebrating the start of the school year. Apparently as they were partying, a man came across the group and told them not to go deeper into the forest. This happened at around 8.30pm, so the group, they still had tons of night left. Rather than heed his warning, the students did the exact opposite. They wanted to go check out what was so scary and unsafe about the depths of this forest. They grabbed their things, and they went into the woods. And since that moment, none of them have ever been seen again. After the students disappeared, police and investigators searched for a while, but with no success. Many people have speculated upon what happened to those students back in 2001. Is there some type of killer loose in the woods? Are the woods haunted by a ghost? Did the students just get lost in the trees? The most popular legend is about an old village from hundreds of years ago called Mirena. This town eventually burned down, but lots of its inhabitants died in the woods from satanic rituals that were being performed in that area. People think that the spirits of those that died here are now what haunt the space. You can tell that they're around you because a strange green fog can be seen forming in the forest. Definitely not a spot I would recommend going considering there's a chance that you might not come back out. Number two on this list is Agrigenic Castle. The Agrigenic Castle is one of the most haunted spots in the country for sure. In fact, many of you were commenting about this place in the last video that I did about Poland. This castle is a medieval castle that's located in south central Poland. It was initially built in the 14th century, but has been rebuilt many times throughout its long history. In the early 17th century, this castle was owned by Stanislaw Wersicki, and it's the spirit of this man that haunts the walls to this day. The spirit of this guy doesn't manifest itself in a human form though. The ghost at this castle is a black dog that has massive chains weighing down on its neck. Stanislaw was said to have been an extremely cruel man when he was alive. He made a fortune during his life but refused to share any of it with anyone, even his own family. His servants and subjects got the worst though. For his own amusement, he would often take them down into the dungeons of his castle and mercilessly torture them there. It's said that even the devil was repulsed by this man's actions and has condemned his spirit to return from hell every now and again in the form of this dog. Howls can be heard and chains scraping across the ground echo throughout the castle walls. Frankly, I think it's a very fitting end that a man who looked at other humans as dogs is now the spirit of one. Number one on this list is the Zofiaka Psychiatric Hospital. This haunted psychiatric hospital is located in Otwok, which is very close to Warsaw. This location is currently abandoned and probably for good reason. It was established in 1907 and was intended to be a psychiatric hospital specifically for Jewish individuals. Prior to World War II, this hospital was considered one of the most prestigious neuropsychiatric centers in all of Poland. As you may expect though, when World War II began and Poland was taken over by the German army, the conditions of this hospital got very bad. The mental institute was still running at the beginning of the German occupation. Its location was inside the Jewish ghetto of Otwok. As I mentioned though, the lifestyle of these Jewish patients, it was horrific. It's estimated that roughly 400 Jewish patients died from starvation and torture in the early goings of the occupation. This all culminated on August 19th, 1942 when a horrible atrocity took place. 100 to 140 of the occupants were rounded up and brought outside the hospital. There they were all executed on the spot. Any patients who remained were put onto the trains along with all of the other Jewish residents of Otwok and sent to the extermination camp Treblinka. It should also be noted that many of the workers at this institute took their own life before they were taken onto the trains. Nowadays this hospital is abandoned and doesn't serve any purpose, but 
Locals have said that it's very haunted. People who go past this spot often hear disturbing moans and cries coming from thin air. People have also seen ghostly apparitions walking around the forest that's right next to this building, a forest where many deaths took place. They describe these apparitions as having blurred faces with a weird glow to them. This is just one of the many spots in Poland that has a horrible history due to the events that transpired during German occupation. If you do ever go to this place, then make sure to show some respect. The atrocities that happened here were real, and we can't take them lightly. Number five on this list is Sismaju Hotel. Located in Bucharest, this hotel was initially built over 100 years ago in 1912 and was first called the Palace Hotel. It was called this because it truly was a marvel back then and was one of the most beautiful spots in the country. The architect who built it owned the property until 1948 when it was ultimately taken by the state. This is where it was given the name that it has today. For the next 20 years or so, the hotel thrived and wasn't only just a spot for the super wealthy to vacation, but was also a spot of parliamentary meetings and other things of great importance. In 1970 though, this hotel shut down. It was simply a side effect of the communist wave that was sweeping through this part of the world and therefore the hotel was neglected for 20 years until finally it reopened in 1990. It wasn't used as a hotel anymore though, but rather as student housing for the students enrolled in the Academy of Film and Theatre. It was during this phase when Sismagu Hotel saw the tragedy that haunts it to this day. Nellie Bajan was a young student who was staying here during her time in school. The semester had come to an end though and it was Christmas time when the incident happened. She was one of the only students who didn't go home for Christmas and instead decided to stay in her dorm. One evening she was walking down the hall and due to some of the lights being out, she stepped into the elevator shaft where there was no elevator waiting for her. She fell down several stories and landed at the bottom of the shaft, writhing in agony. She didn't die immediately though. In fact, it took her over three hours to finally die from her wounds. Three hours where she was screaming and yelling for help, but nobody could hear her because they were all home for Christmas. Now her spirit haunts this place and many students have reported hearing cries for help coming from nowhere. Some have seen her ghost standing at the end of the hallway, looking as if she's desperate for someone's attention. The sad thing about this is that if it would have happened at any other time, when students were in the building, she likely would have been saved and never would have died at all. Just a horrible tragedy that's left its mark on this hotel for good. Number four on this list is the Witch's Pond. So this is a bit of a weird one. The Witch's Pond is a very small collection of water in the Boldu Kristeka Forest that's said to be haunted. A few legends have come from this place. The first one, which I don't actually think is true, but I'm gonna tell you guys anyways, is that Vlad the Impaler was decapitated here. Now it could be possible that this did happen, the truth behind Vlad's death has been debated for centuries, but I find it unlikely that the killers would take him out to this pond in this forest and do it out here. The second legend, which I think is far more likely and probably did actually happen, is that a witch was killed here. An article on the subject writes, as the legend goes, 18th century villagers put a witch to death in the woods near a swampy pond in colonial era cemetery of Equia Creek. Her name, it said, was Edith and her body was tossed into the water. This killing is how the pond got its name, the Witch's Pond. After she was killed, strange occurrences started happening here that couldn't be explained. It said that the water turns blood red in the springtime and sometimes people see a witch-like figure hovering over this bloody liquid. In other reports, there's a sacrificial altar that's spawned here and she's standing by it waiting to sacrifice sacrifice someone. The sound of bodies being thrown into the pond along with a witch's cackle can be heard ringing throughout the forest. Locals avoid this pond and you should too. Also if you think about it, it's just a small pond so I don't really know why you'd be going there anyways. Number three on this list is Yulia Hezdu Castle. Bogdan Hezdu was a Romanian intellectual who was very wealthy at the end of the 18th century. Bogdan, even though he put lots of effort into his work and business, put the most of his time into his daughter. Yulia Hezdu was his daughter and in Bogdan's eyes could do no wrong. That's why when she passed very unexpectedly at the age of 19, Bogdan fell into a deep depression. While she was alive, she was rather remarkable. In her early teens, she knew seven languages and had already graduated several prestigious schools for piano and vocals. She apparently excelled at her schooling as well and was set to have a very fruitful life if she hadn't been taken too early due to tuberculosis. Bogdan, as I mentioned, didn't respond super well to this and reacted by building the Yulia Hasdu Castle. Little did he know that it was going to be haunted. Apparently he partook in spiritism sessions with people who were trained in reaching out to the dead. In these sessions he would communicate with his daughter's ghost and she would tell him how she wanted her castle to be 
constructed. This is how it was built and everything that he decided to do and tell the architect apparently came directly from the ghost of his daughter. Her ghost didn't just leave things be when this castle was finished though, in fact, she fully took up residence here. It's said that the ghost of this girl can be spotted walking throughout the halls of this castle very often. Many people report hearing the sound of a piano playing, assumingly at the hands of this ghost. What's even creepier though is that this piano playing will instantly be followed by the applause of her dead father. Also, this castle has several rooms specifically made for spiritual rituals and also an area to worship Satan. From what I've heard, the ghost here isn't particularly dangerous in nature, but it still sounds like one of the creepier spots in the whole country. Country. Number two on this list is Poenary Fortress. This fortress has been riddled with death and destruction ever since it was first built. Even though in the first part of this series we talked about Dracula's castle, this is the castle where Vlad the Impaler, the inspiration for Dracula's character, spent a large part of his time. It's said that he saw the ruins of a fortress here at the beginning of his rule and thought that it would be a great place for a stronghold. He enslaved his enemies and worked them around the clock to revive the fortress to its former glory. Many of them died due to the extensive of labor and fatigue and those who didn't were killed by being impaled. Now it's said that some of their spirits haunt this place, but they aren't the only ghost that still lingers here. The most notable haunting of this place is actually done by Vlad the Impaler's wife. During Vlad's reign, this fortress fell under siege by his enemies. Vlad was able to escape the castle, but his wife wasn't so lucky. The castle was falling, and rather than get captured by the oncoming army, she decided to fling herself off of the castle walls over top of a cliff. Her body fell far and dropped into a river River many hundreds of feet below. It's said that the river ran red with blood and it was nicknamed the Lady's River following this. Her ghost now forever wanders around this castle restless. Some say that her soul can never find peace because she can never forgive her husband for abandoning her all those years ago. This is why locals say that she has it out for any married men that visit the castle. Although visiting this castle would definitely make for a fun day trip, it might just not be worth it. Number one on this list is Hoi Bachu Forest. Often referred to as the Bermuda Triangle of Transylvania, this forest is on pretty much everyone's list when it comes to the most haunted forests in the world. It all started when in 1968, a military technician took a photo of the area and captured what looked to be a UFO hovering over top of the woods. An article from My Best Place writes, after this incident, other inexplicable events soon followed, including the disappearance of a shepherd and his 200 sheep which were never found again, and the disappearance of a five-year-old girl who later reappeared five years later wearing the same clothes and without having aged even one day. There have also been many first-hand reports from people who have entered the forest only to come out with burns, severe rashes, headaches, and a high fever which they didn't have before. Some studies have revealed higher than usual radioactivity produced by by natural uranium present in the subsoil. The part in that article about burns and rashes and other things is one of the most common reports described by the people who go here. It seems that everyone who enters into these woods leaves with some sort of trauma. Most of that trauma is mental though. Feelings of despair and depression are widely documented from pretty much everyone who steps foot into this forest. All of the numerous reports, the photographs, and the general lore around this place has to make it the most haunted spot in all of Romania. Definitely not a forest that I recommend going to if you're looking to get outdoors.